Thank you for coming once again uh, for worship today. We are continuing with our study on the life of Christ, understanding Christ, looking at Jesus, following Jesus. It's a lifelong process. It's a joy. It's a, it's a delight for any believer to be able to, to know their master. And after knowing Jesus, we, we get to just know him even more. We can never reach a place where we say, now I have known Jesus enough. I, <laughs> I don't need to know him more than I know him now. We have been in Matthew chapter 13 uh, and Mark chapter 4. We've been looking at, at the parables of Jesus. We saw that Jesus started to teach the multitude in parables all the way from Matthew chapter 13. We have looked at a few of those parables in the past few Sundays, the parable of the sower or the soils, if you prefer, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, uh, about hidden growth, um, about small, humble beginnings of the kingdom of God, about how we should prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. As I thought about these parables and, and what I have been teaching, I thought, as I thought about how Christians over the years have understood the parables, I thought it is just fair to say a few things before I continue today. Good Christians disagree on whether these parables talk about the church, the kingdom of God at the present time, or the kingdom of God which is to come. And you may even be seated there, you may have been listening to my sermons and you have been saying, but no, Martin, I don't agree with you. I think these parables of Jesus, when he says the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus is talking about not present, but future. And it is only fair that I say that, because not everyone is convinced that the kingdom of God has come. I am, I am convinced, I am convinced for the reasons I've been giving you uh, as, as we've gone through the life of Christ. It's the way Jesus presents the kingdom. The kingdom has come. The kingdom is come. The kingdom is here. It is by, by thinking about how a kingdom operates. As I said, a kingdom must have three things for it to be a kingdom. There has to be a king. There has to be subjects. There has to be a place. Without any of these three, there cannot be a kingdom. And, and Christ came and he saved my heart, he saved your heart, and he is king of your heart or king of your life. He rules over you. So the kingdom has come, but it is not yet. It is not yet come fully as it ought to come. We are still awaiting for the full realization of that. But perhaps you may be listening and your conviction is that what Jesus is talking about, talk, he's, he's, he talks about what will happen in the millennium. And some people think of that way. Some people even think Jesus is talking about how the kingdom of God will actually be in heaven. So, for example, uh, if you look at uh, the parables we looked at last Sunday, the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed, uh, by my understanding, says, means that the kingdom of God will have small, humble beginnings, but it will continue growing. Or leaven symbolizes how there is hidden growth in the kingdom of God. But some people will say, mm, let's just stop for a minute and think about this. If you go through the Bible and you look, anywhere you find leaven, someone will argue against my conviction. Leaven is always used negatively to symbolize sin. How come here it is used positively? Only one place in the Bible shall you build your entire conviction based on this one place in the Bible, where else the disciples, where else the prophets, where else we are told to put away the leaven out of us. Or perhaps when Jesus was talking about the mustard seed and he says how from that small seed that I gave you last Sunday, the, the, it grows and it becomes a big tree where birds are able to perch on that tree. And someone thinks, is really the mustard tree that big? Secondly, when you read of what the birds symbolize in the Bible, they seem to symbolize evil. Even we saw that in the parable of the soils where the devil symbolizes as Satan comes and takes away the word that that person had and the word is of no effect. So it cannot mean small humble beginnings. You understand what I mean? Some of you have. 
Some of you are mature in the word of God. When you read the Bible, it calls us to move from drinking milk to the deeper, significant, wider things of the kingdom of God. And it is important, we cannot always be drinking milk, we cannot always be remaining children. Perhaps you have been saved for, say, 10 years. Surely you should be able to say, where I am now, in terms of understanding of who God is and his word, is not where I was eight years ago, six years ago. I am growing in grace, as Peter says in Second Peter. I am advancing in my knowledge of the kingdom of God. There were things which were hard for me to figure out, but now the Holy Spirit has made those things easier to understand. So some of these things, you may want to digest them more. And, uh, and, and if you are able, you can get a concordance and, and do some word studies. Uh, you can go on the internet and buy a software called Sword Searcher. Sword Searcher is sold for about $50. I know it's a lot of money, about 200,000 Uganda shillings. But you can save. You can save for a few months and buy it. It's, it's amazing. It has commentaries. You can have it on your computer as you're, as you're studying the word of God. You can be looking at the word, for example, bad or leaven. And you type leaven. And it brings you all manner of places in the Bible where you find the word leaven. Then you start to think, how does the Bible explain this word? So, with all of these things I am saying, Maybe there, and you're saying, no, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about refers to the millennium, how it will be in the millennium, when all of these birds that symbolize evil people who have patched themselves on the church and attached themselves to the church, Jesus will remove all of them and do away with them. Or 11, which is also used negatively in the Bible, refers to how God will deal away with sin in the kingdom that is to come, and so on and so forth as we look at these parables. That may be your understanding of them, and if you haven't reached there, I'm giving you the challenge to do that. The Lord saved me on September 5th, 2005. It was at 9.30 a.m., and over the years, I've had the privilege of knowing him and having a relationship with him and studying his word. But every time I approach his word, I feel as if I have only scratched the foot of a very big mountain like Mount Kenya. Or I don't know which mountain is big in Uganda, Mount Elgon. I feel as if I've only scratched just the foot of that mountain. There is so much to dig into and to study. And so I thought it fair to say this before I continue with my parable. So if you disagree with me and you hold a different conviction of that, that is very good. Only let your different conviction be based on the Bible. Sometimes people don't want to hear that Christians disagree on things in the Bible. But it is the reality, isn't it? You read something and you don't agree with the way someone else presented it. You say, no, that's not for now, that's for tomorrow. Someone asked me someday, why, don't you, why do you baptize your children by immersion? And we said, we don't baptize our children by immersion. We only baptize those who have believed in Jesus Christ. Then they ask, okay, why do you baptize by immersing? Because that's what we are convinced about. We don't sprinkle. We are not convinced that we should sprinkle children when they are young. But you may come from a place where people do that. Some people have asked me, how come we, our service follows this kind of an order. Why don't we follow this kind of an order? It's better. We say because our preference is this particular order that we follow. It's who we are. And uh, there are other churches which may follow the particular order that you desire. By God's providence, he has allowed that to happen so that people can be in places where they are convinced of. And so, think about these things as we go through the life of Jesus and as you read the scriptures, how your convictions, how your understanding relates to the biblical perspective from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis all the way to Revelation. We are continuing with the parables. There's a parable that Matthew does not give us in Matthew chapter 13. But Jesus spoke that parable in the same breath that he spoke the parables in Matthew chapter 13. And this one is in Mark Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to verse 29. So if you have a Bible time there in Mark 4, 26 to 29, and then we will 
Turn again to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, and verse to verse 52. Five parables are presented, perhaps four, by Jesus in this text. Mark chapter 4, verse 26, Jesus said, So is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed into the ground. And that person should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. With what shall I liken the kingdom of God? Jesus says in the next verse, verse 30. In what shall I use to demonstrate what the kingdom of God is like to you? He uses an agricultural metaphor, an agricultural idea. The kingdom of God is like someone who took seed and then he went and, and, and cast that seed into the ground. The method of planting at this time was broadcasting. You know broadcasting, where you just take the seeds and, and you throw them all over the field. Sorry for the feedback on my mic. And you throw them all over the field. That's how they would. So someone took the seed and threw them all over the field, cast them on the ground. And then that person went and continued with their life. The way the Bible puts it is that, that the person slept. And night and day, he doesn't know. Do you know when you plant maize? Do you know when you plant beans, how it grows up under the soil? You don't stay there night and day observing. Today, because of advances in technology and science and so forth, we understand more. By the time when Jesus is talking, they did not really understand how that happens. Neither do we, at least not entirely. So this person night and day goes to sleep, and the seed sprouts is what we are told. It grows. How it grows, the person cannot explain. We cannot be able to explain it but it produces crop by itself. First the blade, or your version may say the ear, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But what happens when the grain is mature? What happens when the crop is ready? The man, the person who is doing the sowing, he takes the sickle and he brings it to himself. He harvests it. It is time for harvest. What Jesus is saying here is that the growth of the kingdom of God cannot be coerced. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be forced. We cannot force the growth. We cannot make the growth happen. It is only God who knows how the kingdom of God grows. Think about how you preach the word of God to someone. And you explain to them how that many, many years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, someone came to this world. He, he, he lived as a human being. But this was no ordinary person. He was born of a virgin. He is God himself. He was 100% God and 100% man. He became like one of us. And he walked among people. And his ministry lasted only three years. But he did this so that he could save a people for himself. And that if you believe in what this person did, that he died, that he rose again, that he lived a perfect life, that he died a perfect death, that he resurrected a perfect resurrection, if you believe in his work on the cross, you will be saved. And then someone hears that, and then someone believes it, and then someone gets it, and then someone is convicted of their sin. And then you go ahead to explain, listen, you are holy, sorry, you are sinful, but God is holy. And this person who lived almost this 2,000 years ago, he's the only person who can take away that sin. And the person says, I see my sin, I see my error, and I believe. 
can't force it, you can't manipulate it, you can't coerce it. That kind of faith can only be developed by the work of God, by the word of God. Sometimes you may preach to someone all your life. Some of you seated here have people that you, that you pray for, that you ask God that he would save them. But until today, they are not saved. You can't force it, you can't manipulate it, you can't, you can't make it to happen. But the kingdom of God, the church of God, the work of God, the word of God, the people of God, they advance. They continue going on and on and on, and no one can be able to explain it. So Jesus says here, it's how the kingdom of God is like. And at harvest time, God makes that clear when immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come, because the harvest is now full. And maybe you may think of this in two ways, that the continual preaching of the gospel will eventually result in people being saved, and at just the right time, God will put in the sickle, bring his people, and bring everything to an end. Or maybe you can think about how someone listens to the gospel, how you proclaim the word of God, and someone receives it in their heart, and you preach again, and maybe they receive it in their heart, and you preach again, and they receive it in their heart, until at some point in time, the harvest comes full circle, and the person is saved. And the person is born again. This is the parable of the growing seed. There is a seed that is, that is growing. The kingdom of God is growing and it is advancing, and it is going forward. How? We cannot be able to explain. Many times, Christians are asked questions. They are asked to explain this, or they are asked to explain the other, and sometimes the answer is just, I don't know. I do not know, and I do not have to know. Sometimes you may be asked, so you serve one God, yes, but you're talking of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Aren't those three gods? And say, no, he is one God who presents himself in three persons. Really? Yes, how? How does that happen? And maybe you pull out some biblical text and you, and you support what you are convinced of, but ultimately you have more questions than answers in explaining this teaching about the triune God. Someone once said, if you try to understand it, you will lose your mind. If you deny it, you will lose your soul. Just believe it. I'm not asking you to have some kind of a blind faith. But there are things that, just like the parable of the growing seed, you won't be able to understand how it happens. But by God's grace, it happens and by the view of your eyes, it happens. So after this, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44, Jesus gives other parables. Verse 44, all the way to verse 52. In verse 44, Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure. Treasure that was hidden in a field, which when a man found, he hides, and for the joy thereof goes and sells all that he has, and that person buys that field. He sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Want to know how the kingdom of God is like? This is how it is like, Jesus says. <laughs> Anytime I read this parable, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hidden in a field. I always can't help but think about that story that some of you may have already heard about. It's been titled The Acres of Diamonds. Have you heard about it? It's about this man who, during a time when there was a boom for jewels, decided, I also need to make money as a result of selling costly jewels. So what the man did is that he went and sold his field. And then he went out all over trying to look for a field, a piece of land that will contain diamonds that he can be able to sell and make money and make merchandise and grow himself. 
The story says eventually out of desperation, when he was not able to find diamonds, he, he drowned himself in a river and died. But then the person who bought his field, one day during the ordinary, normal course of his life, as he was going about his field, he went into a, a creek. I was reading the difference between a creek and a stream. English makes so many distinctions of small things that, anyway, he went in and, and, and there was a creek in his field. And then he was this shiny, iridescent kind of stone in it. So he picked up the stone, looked at it, looked beautiful, but he didn't know what it was. So he went home, he put it on his shelf somewhere, and then he continued with life. Then some time later, his friend came to visit, and as his friend was with him in the house, he looked at his shelf, and he saw this stone and admired it. And when he laid hold of it, he asked his friend, do you know what you have here? Do you know what you are holding here? Do you know what you have put on your shelf? And the story goes on to say that that was the biggest diamond that has ever been discovered. And that man explained, oh, I found it in my creek, and there are so many of these kinds of stones. And that man who bought the field from the other man who went in search of diamonds became very wealthy. The point of the story usually is the place where you are, the treasure is just there. Sometimes we want to look at it in other places, but it's there. The same way English tells us about the grass being greener on the other side. The same English tells us that maybe it's because that person is watering it better or taking care of it better, but to my eyes it looks greener. There was treasure that was hidden in a field so someone found it, and when he found it, the Bible tells us, he hid it again. He did not steal it. Now, you're wondering, what does this, I don't understand this, how can he find treasure and hide it? Well, at that time, because people didn't have banks and safety deposit boxes and, and vaults and all those kinds of places where people keep their most treasured possessions, people would put it in jars of clay. Does it sound familiar? Paul tells us about that we have this treasure in jars of clay. So they will take their treasure, put it in jars of clay, dig down somewhere in the ground, and hide it underneath there. And they would do that maybe when there was war or they had to leave their country and they had to go somewhere else. And only they knew where they hid the treasure. So today we talk of treasure hunt for those who enjoy treasure hunts. So later on, if someone were to find that treasure, it wasn't illegal if they possessed it for themselves. So this person finds it, and for the joy of it, goes and sells everything that he has and comes and buys that field. This person really stumbles upon this treasure. This parable is very similar to the one in verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. They're very similar, with one exception. This pearl of great price, this person was actually searching for it, they were looking for it. But the other person who found the treasure hidden in a field, they were not looking for it. This person found a pearl. Interesting how pearls are formed. Oysters. From oysters are where we get those very costly pearls, especially the natural ones. There are some that are not natural. You can say they are unnatural, and people grow them in ponds and make it happen and sell them. But natural pearls are very costly. I was looking at the most expensive pearl that has ever been found, and they say it cost about $5 million. U.S. dollars at the present time. There are artificial ones that have been designed by, yes, you guessed it, the Chinese. One particular one is worth $200 million. Imagine that. It is very big. It is um, about three meters high. But how are pearls formed? They are formed by oysters. When an irritation gets in the mantle of the oyster's shell. And, and so for the oyster to protect itself, it produces nacre. 
or is it Nakra, or is it Naka? That word is so complicated in my mind to pronounce it properly, but N-A-C-R-E. And, and this binds up the irritation to protect the oyster. And then it forms that beautiful, elegant, lovely pearl. And then, of course, the oyster has to die if someone is to have the pearl all around their neck. So this person, they found a pearl of great price. And what they do, upon finding it, they went and sold all that they had. He went and sold everything that he had, and then they, they came and bought it. It doesn't matter what he has. It doesn't matter how much he has. This pearl is worth everything to this person. This field is worth everything to this person because this person knows what is in the field. What is the most treasured thing to you? Ever thought about it? What is the most treasured thing to you today? People have all manner of treasures, don't they? Maybe you may say it is some saving or some investment. Maybe you would say it's some piece of land somewhere, it's some money in an account, it's, it's jewels that I have, it's vehicles that I have. Something physical is what mostly people attribute to the treasures that they have. And people store a lot of treasures for themselves. What is the most valuable treasure that you have? Would you be able to sell all of your treasures for just one thing? If someone said, I will give you this one thing in exchange for all of your treasures, would there be something so valuable in your life? In my own life, if I could sell, if I could, if I could give away everything that I have now and in future, and my daughter Amanda were able to talk and just live a normal life, I would gladly give it all away. I would not even think twice about it. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. Tell me to work all my life with no pay, I am happy to do it. There is something of more worth than that, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is worth laying down all of the treasures that we have to be able to attain it. Everything that you consider precious in your life to be able to attain it. It is worth overcoming all the obstacles and all the challenges and all the trials and the tribulations that we come across in this world in order to attain it. You can go through an army, through a host. You can be able to break down a wall as long as you enter the kingdom of God if it is that precious unto you. If only that you would know Christ. If only that you would know the power of his resurrection. The Bible tells us. We read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 that Jesus Christ, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned its shame and he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that is set before you, the, the kingdom of God is righteousness, isn't it? The kingdom of God is joy. The kingdom of God is peace in the Holy Spirit. So we set our eyes on Jesus and we say, it doesn't matter the circumstances around me. It doesn't matter if I feel as if I am making it or not making it, if, I'm, if, I'm, if things are going well or are not going well, if I have everything I want or I don't have everything I want, I am advancing forward by grace to the kingdom of God. It is most treasured to me. It is most treasured to you, the Christian. So this person sold everything. This person who was, who was seeking. The other person was not seeking for the treasure in the field. And sometimes, people come, to, people come to faith in Jesus that way. Maybe you came to faith in Jesus that way. You are not, not even looking for Jesus, so to speak. But at some point, someone came and preached the gospel, or you found the Bible and read it, or a missionary came and explained the gospel, and you are, my, your eyes were opened, and you found the most cherished treasure in your life. Perhaps for some people, they went reading about all manner of religions from Hinduism to Jainism to Sikhism to Buddhism to Confucianism to whatever ism is there. And they even read the 66 documents of the, of the, of the Christian faith, the Bible. 
And they wanted in their mind to be convinced, is this, is this really true? I don't understand this man Jesus, but the things that he's talking about make sense to me. They were seeking for it. Sometimes people come to faith like that. Perhaps the greatest preacher in all history next to Paul himself may have well been Charles Spurgeon. He's called the Prince of Preachers. At just 19 years of age, <laughs> he had a congregation in, in London that was, I don't know how many times bigger than we are. Thousands of people at 19 years of age. He was saved at 15 years of age. You know how he was saved? He had this burden in his heart. He knew he was a sinner, but he had not believed in Jesus Christ. And he was carrying this weight all of his life. At least his life until 15 years of age, because he had been explained the word to him. Then one day as he was going to church, there was a, a rainstorm, maybe a snowstorm. And he had to be diverted from the way that he was going. He was going to One Life Church, but he couldn't get there. And then he stumbled upon a small Methodist church of maybe about 15 people in attendance there. In that Methodist church, that particular Sunday, the preacher could not make it, the pastor of that church, maybe because of the same rain or snowstorm. And so someone from the congregation had stepped up. I've always thought one day, what if I don't make it to preach and I'm preaching? If someone does not make it and I've invited them and I'm here, I always feel, okay, that is easier to handle. <laughs> so the pastor never made it. Well, the elders are here. I'm sure they'll step up and preach, so don't worry. So elders, I, I know they always have a someone ready. So the preacher didn't make it. So someone stepped up to preach. And when the pastor stepped up to preach, because clearly he had not prepared, the pastor preached from Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. And, 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 and Spurgeon later says this person had not much to say. So he kept repeating the same thing. Look to me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no one else. And kept repeating these same things. And at some point in time, this person looked directly at Spurgeon and told him, look unto me, Jesus says, and be ye saved. And at that point, he felt the voice of God speaking to him, and he was converted. He was not looking for it. He was not going after it. He, so to speak, stumbled upon the word of God. Some people find the kingdom of God like that. Again, the kingdom of heaven, verse 47, it's like, it's like a dragnet. It's like a net cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew near to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but they cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the parable of the net. It's like a net that was cast into the sea. Maybe this net is, is what is called a sane net that has large, they would tie large stones on one side of the net and then some floating kind of items on the top part of the net. So the net, the, the top part of the net would float on the water, but the bottom part would go as deep as it could go into the lake. So they threw that net into the water and then they started dragging it. And when it was full, they drew it to shore. The Bible tells us they drew it up on the beach. And they that sat down, they gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad fish they threw away. They don't know what they are going to catch. They don't know what the net is going to bring forth. But it catches all manner of things. Some of them certainly not fish. So they brought it to shore and they started sorting it. And what they did is that they, 
They took the good and they threw away the bad. There was someone one day who went fishing. And there was someone who was observing the man who was fishing. And the man who was fishing, when they would fish a small fish and catch a small fish, they would put it in their bucket. But when they would get a big fish, they would throw it back into the water. So this man, the observer observing the fisherman, wonders, what is he doing? It should be the opposite, shouldn't it? For those who love fishing. Anyway, even if you have a common man's understanding of fishing, you would think, I need to throw the smaller fish back so that I can fish it another day. But this man wasn't doing that. He was keeping only the small fish and throwing the big fish back into the sea. So the observer went to the Finnish fisherman and asked him, what are you doing? Then the fisherman explained, oh, I'm keeping the small fish with me because my frying pan is this small. So I definitely have to fish the fish which is this small. And the observer was obviously, as you would, annoyed with him and told him, go home and buy a bigger frying pan. Surely you cannot be doing this. You cannot be taking the small fish because of the size of your frying pan. They kept the good and they threw the bad away. Then Jesus says, this is how it will be at the end of the age. Now, the good here may refer to, as I said, maybe the, the small fish. They put it back in the water. The bird may refer to other things that they caught in the lake that were not suitable for eating. They were not fish. And this one, we can't eat it. Or all manner of things that are found in the lake. If you read Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 9 to verse 12, there were, there were certain animals, certain sea creatures that God had forbidden his people from eating. So maybe that's a reason why they had to put some of them back into the lake. We read this in Leviticus 11, verse 9. This shall you eat of all that are in the water, whatever has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, you shall eat that, if it has fins and scales. And all that has not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters and of anything living which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatever has no fins, no scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. So the fishermen who are likely Jews, when they, would, when they fished this, they likely selected what God had said is clean, and they kept it, and what God had said is unclean. By that criteria, they put it back into the water. So it will be at the end of the age, Jesus says. At the end of all things, at the end of the world, the angels, God's messengers, will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. Similar to the other parable of the wheat and the weeds, of the wheat and the tares. There will be a separation of the wicked from the righteous, of the unjust from the just. But even more beautiful than that, there will be a separation of wickedness and sinfulness from the righteous, from those who are just. And Jesus here says, and we'll throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be a pain that cannot be expressed in words. There will be a fire that is never quenched. In Palestine at that time, there was a huge garbage dump where before people were observing child sacrifices. But at that time, it had developed into a garbage dump. And garbage had piled there. And people would burn the garbage there. And that place was always burning. So when Jesus talks to the people at that time about a fire that is never quenched, they had that idea in mind. Is that garbage place... That the fire, as long as I have lived, if you wake up night or day, the fire is always burning. 
Then you think, what about when it rains? Oh, it was big enough that the water couldn't permeate the bottom part of the garbage. Sometimes some of you burn garbage. And sometimes the fire doesn't reach the bottom part of the garbage. Jesus says he will throw them into the furnace of fire, a place they understood to mean damnation. Have you understood all these things? My dear church members, have you understood all these things? That's exactly how the disciples in Jesus' day responded. Verse 51. Jesus asked them that very same question. Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes. My version says, yeah, Lord. Like, yeah. Yeah, man. We get you. Yes, they said. <laughs> Do you think they understood? What happens after this, leading to the death of Jesus, sure they did not. But because they answered yes, because you answered yes, Jesus says, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasures things that are new and things that are old. A scribe was an expert in the law, a teacher of the law, someone who understood the word of God. Jesus tells his disciples, you shall be like that, understanding the word of God. Being able, it's as if you have guests in your house. And you know the way people have, when you have guests in your house, uh, maybe not, but uh, coming from Kenya, when we, we had certain plates and spoons that were special for guests, and we had certain plates and spoons and cups, utensils, that's the word I should use, that were only for us on a normal, regular basis. There were some that were classic. And so, when a visitor comes, maybe you remove those really good ones, those vintage ones, and you serve them using those ones. Or you remove the new ones, and you say, I want to serve you with these ones. I want to serve you with these plates that I was given by the king of wherever, Thailand, Uganda, wherever. I want to serve you with this. This is the idea that Jesus means when he says the kingdom of God is like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. You, my disciples, will so understand my word, you will be able to relate the Old Testament with the New Testament. You will be able to take what is written from Genesis to Malachi, what is written from Genesis to Chronicles, and be able to relate that with with the church, with the New Testament church. You'll be able to bring those treasures, combine them together, and, and like that pearl that is, that is iridescent and beautiful, like that diamond that is glowing, that is multifaceted, that is beautiful, you'll be able to display this to the entire world. The New Testament is as important as the Old Testament. The Old Testament is as important as the New. Some people disregard the Old and say they're only reading the New. But did you know that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed? And that the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed? You can't understand one without the other. It is not either or, it is both and. And Jesus says, you my disciples who have understood all of these things, this is how you will be. And it came to pass, verse 53, that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. And he went somewhere else and started doing other things, which things we shall see in days and weeks to come.